Right guys, how's it going? Welcome back. We're all car nerds here, aren't we? Well, you know that buzz you get, that, that fizz when you drive something that means something to you? Whether it's big, small, fast, slow. Sometimes it doesn't really make sense, but I know you'll know exactly what I mean. The trouble is doing my job, where you jump in and out of dozens of different cars every day, you kind of, you become immune to it. You lose that feeling. I imagine it's how sex workers feel. Anyway, all morning I've been driving around in this late 2018 Jaguar XJ, and I'm happy to report, I've got it back. It's like, it's almost like butterflies. I can't really explain it. It's just a feeling of happiness. I feel very content. You'll know what I mean. Certain cars will do the same thing to you. It's no wonder, really. I mean, just look at it. The combination of Italian racing red paintwork and its huge grey R-Sport wheels. And the contrasting black rear pillar. It's an Eiffel. In fact, the only place that's better than stood outside the XJ looking at it is sat in it, behind the steering wheel. The interior is a masterpiece. It fills me with joy. This generation of XJ was released in 2010 to quite a mixed response. Some loved it, some hated it, but few are ambivalent towards it. Right from the offset, I needn't tell you which camp I'm in. In fact, I'd go as far as to say, I don't think I could be friends with somebody who doesn't like Jaguar's flagship. It's terrific. I love the fact that Jaguar threw caution to the wind with this model. They dared to be different. I keep catching my reflection in these plate glass windows and it brings a smile to my face. It's a stunner. Most importantly though, it looks right wherever you go, whether that's here in the city centre or out here in the countryside. That's better. You can't beat the fresh air in the open road. I really take this for granted, you know, living so close to the great outdoors. The old saying's right, you just don't know what you've got in your own backyard. Unless, of course, you're Fred West. Anyway, this X351 Jaguar replaced the X358, and this model ran from 2010 until 2019. It was available with various different engines. The petrol started with a 3 litre V6 with 340 horsepower, all the way up to a supercharged 575 horsepower 5 litre V8. That's found in the XJR. That model is brutal, by the way. Perfect if you like the smell of burnt rubber and your passengers vomit, or worse. There was also a diesel, which is the model I'm in today. It's a 300 horsepower turbo diesel V6. As I've mentioned many times before, I'm not a huge fan of diesel cars, but with fuel currently sitting at over two pounds a litre, I like the idea of something that's capable of doing 35 miles per gallon round town and over 50 on a motorway run. It's far easier on the wallet than the 18 MPG I get from my own V8. I've stayed today consistently around 42 miles per gallon combined, which is really enviable. You also can't really tell that it's an oil burner, it's nice and quiet. When you first start it up, it does sound quite diesel-y for about 30 seconds, but then it settles right down. And then you could be fooled into thinking it's running on honey. Its 77 litre fuel tank will, unfortunately, in today's mad world, set you back around 150 pounds to brim. But if driven carefully in the right conditions, you'll do nearly 900 miles from that tank of fuel. It's incredible. And what a pleasure those 900 miles would be. It's no slouch, this either. It'll do 155 miles an hour and it's capable of doing 0 to 62 in 6.2 seconds. Just to put that into context, that's exactly the same figure as the Ford Focus ST that I filmed with recently. And that's a hot hatch. This is a thatched cottage on wheels. What's also difficult to get your head around is the fact that this is over five meters long and it's as luxurious as a Park Lane hotel. And yet it only weighs 1800 kilograms. You don't have to be a physics professor to know that excess weight kills performance. That's why something like a Lexus LS handles like a cruise liner. And this, this doesn't. It's genuinely sporty. It feels really agile. You can properly hustle this thing along. I cannot tell you how enjoyable an experience this is. In fact, yes I can, what am I talking about? This is a very enjoyable experience. There you go, how's that? If you intend on being chauffeured around in this rather than driving it yourself, in all honesty, you're better off going with a Audi A8 long wheelbase or a Mercedes S-Class. How is it back there? It's actually better than I thought. There's plenty of leg room. Headroom isn't brilliant because the roof slopes down, but it's all right. Seats are very comfortable. I've also got heated and cooled seats back here as well. If you're absolutely adamant though, you want to be chauffeured around in the big cat, then you're better off going for the XJL. That's the long wheelbase version of this car, and it gives you an extra 10 centimeters of legroom in the back. Personally though, I wouldn't bother because this is one car that's been designed for the driver. I also don't like the look of long wheelbase cars in general. 
They just look a bit odd. The proportions look off. They look like they've been through a mangle. And really, this is plenty big enough anyway, without turning around an extra six inches of carpet and air. There's plenty of room up front, plenty of headroom, plenty of leg room, plenty of elbow room. Visibility is very good. The boot offers 478 litres of cargo space. Early models were fitted with a six-speed automatic gearbox, but from 2012 onwards, that changed to an eight-speed. They all have the same rotary gear selector, and I've had lots of both, and I honestly can't tell you the difference. There isn't one that sticks out my memory as being better. So whether you go for the six-speed or the eight-speed, I think you'll still be quite satisfied. Obviously, the eight-speed's newer, and on a run, you'll get an extra couple of miles per gallon. So, as with everything, I suppose it's better to go with the newest one you can afford. But I wouldn't get bogged down in that small detail. This is the latest XJ I've ever had though, and what has greatly improved over the years is the technology. All of them come with the digital gauge cluster and the touchscreen infotainment screen, but this facelifted model comes with the latest screens. In fact, it looks identical to my facelifted L405 Range Rover. If I were in the market for an XJ, I'd try and find one from 2017 onwards, because it greatly benefits from this updated tech. For example, the clarity of the reverse camera compared to the early models is like putting on glasses for the first time. It's the same story with the gauge clusters, and it's fully customizable so you can change the layout. It just helps to keep the XJ up to date. I'd recommend you go for a high spec model, either an autobiography, a portfolio, or a sporty R Sport model like this. The base model luxury and the middle of the road premium luxury, they're okay, but on a car like this, you want all the toys. This R Sport model has all the trappings of success. For example, you've got a nice suede headlining, a sunroof, reverse camera, a heated steering wheel. I could live with this. Okay, right, I think I've sang this car's praises enough. Time for a couple of punches. Firstly then, some of the buttons and some of the interior trim feels a bit, a bit cheap, a bit hollow. The exterior door handles are the same. They feel a bit, what's the word? French. Also with age and use, the surface of all these buttons wears off. It hasn't done on this one because it's only done 19,000 miles but I've had some that have done 100 or 120,000 miles and you can't tell what the buttons are for. The next issue is the ride quality. It isn't as soft as you'd expect. I think it's a good compromise between sportiness and comfort. But if what you're looking for is a soft, pillowy ride, then you're out of luck. There's also no 360 camera. There's no massaging seats. The sunroof channels rust. The window regulators and door latches are about as reliable as a politician's promise. But, 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 none of that matters. The car is so good in general, it's worth putting up with a few dodgy door latches. It's such a good all-rounder. It's complete. In terms of engine and gearbox reliability, the early V8 suffered with bad timing chain guides. The diesels have weak cranks, although I'm just parroting there what I've read in the comments section. I've had lots of these and I've never had any issues. Touch wood. The gearboxes are quite reliable, if looked after. In fact, the same is true of the rest of the car. In fact, the same is true of most cars, isn't it? The diesels have a timing belt which needs to be replaced every 105,000 miles or eight years, whichever's soonest. That'll set you back around 400 pounds for a new one. I'd recommend getting the gearbox serviced every 80,000 miles, there or thereabouts. And, and I change the oil and filter at least every 10,000 miles or 12 months. I'd also recommend running it on premium fuel, something like Shell V-Power. I know it's more expensive and fuel's ridiculously expensive at the moment, but it is worth it. At least do it every other fill up. Give it half a chance. And the rest really is down to luck. I wouldn't let other people's horror stories put me off. I'm a realist. Use prices here in the UK start at around 5,000 pounds, but I wouldn't buy one for five grand. I'd spend around 10,000 pounds and get yourself a half decent one. For one like this, this is a late 2018 R Sport model with only 19,000 miles. This will set you back around 35,000 pounds, which I know is a lot of money, but if you compare this to a 2018-2019 Range Rover with similar miles, that'd set you back around £70,000 or more. It makes the XJ look good value, doesn't it? One thing I've noticed about the XJ is you can comfortably buy it whatever age you are. In metallic champagne in portfolio spec, it'll appeal if you still remember rationing. And in a sporty spec like this with the big wheels, it appeals to people who know who Stormzy is. There's an XJ for everybody. Well, I think that's about it. Actually, no, it's not. I do have one question in case Jaguar are watching. Why, oh why, did you stop making the XJ? As somebody rightly said in the comments section on my Instagram when I posted a picture of this car, it's a bit like when your favorite TV show ends. You just feel a bit lost. 
Jaguar have lost serious market presence by not offering a luxurious limousine. I just don't get it. I mean, what's John Prescott supposed to drive now? To be fair, I love all the big barges. The 7 Series, the A8, the S-Class, the Lexus LS. But there's just something ever so slightly more special about the XJ. And as of 2019, it's gone. And I don't think we'll see another. And on that sad note, thank you once again for watching. You know, I recently watched back my first XJ video that I did a few years ago, just to make sure I didn't repeat myself. That video, by the way, is up to 737,000 views. Can you believe that? So it seems slightly surreal to be saying thank you once again as we hurtle towards the 200,000 subscriber mark. It's mad, isn't it? Thank you for joining me on this journey. And yeah, thanks for your continued support. So cheers, guys. We'll see you next time.